Anyway, I'm glad to see you all here, including many old uh, familiar faces, uh, um, people who knew me a very long time ago as a long-haired motorbike riding freelance correspondent in Jakarta, and um, <coughs> will probably uh, um, treat me with a certain degree of uh, a pinch of salt because of that. Um, but anyway, I, I um, recently um, returned to Jakarta after um, having um, been made unwelcome at the end of my first posting there in the late 70s and um, spending most of the uh, uh, 1980s on a blacklist of the former Ministry of Information and then um, coming back sporadically usually at times of crisis and elections and transition. Um, but then uh, a, f a year ago, spending a lot of time revisiting Indonesia and looking at how much it's changed. And one, <coughs> some, one telling example that came to me was when I uh, went looking for my old house in a, what was a kampung at the back of um, quite close to the uh, Hotel Indonesia. Um, of course, the Hotel Indonesia has been turned into apartments with a huge complex behind it. And <coughs> the little alleyway where my old house stood um, was uh, a, a zone bereft of any buildings with bulldozers and workmen preparing it for another mega development. The, uh, street was still there, but the laneway, Gang Sukayu, had disappeared. Um, along with uh, a population of, of um, small people, peddlers and so on, and religious scholars and others who made me and my um, uh, little family then um, very welcome. Um, but that's a sign of what's happening in Jakarta and many of the other big cities. And of course, um, the research for this new book I've done uh, coincided with the run-up to the uh, uh, election campaign last year in July, and um, and then um, to do an update for an American edition, I went there for the election and stayed around till the result was out. Um, so that was a very exciting time. And of course, um, like everyone uh, who followed Indonesia, I got caught up in the beguiling story of Jokowi, Jokowi Dodo. Um, I'll just recap, um, probably most of you know it, but I'll just go through it. He's a Javanese boy raised in a squatter home on the banks of a river in Solo. Had a father who was a carpenter who had half the house devoted to his lumber business. He was a skinny but diligent boy, studying hard through the state school system. Went and did a forestry degree uh, at Gajamada University, one of the best in uh, Indonesia. Um, but forestry, not, not one of the hot faculties. Uh, later, uh, after some work experience, he returned to Solo, became mayor of the city, um, and made a name for tidying up the city, regulating the markets, restoring some of the old um, ambience of the streets and building up its image as a tourism centre for crafts and tradition, uh, as well as pioneering a local health and welfare system and in the process um, banishing the Islamist militants from the Ngruki Pasantran on the fringes of the city uh, from uh, bullying tactics ar around the city. Um, they've largely disappeared from the scene. He then took this model uh, of in-touch governments to the capital, Jakarta, in the 2012 elections when he was brought in and effectively beat the system, beat sort of establishment politicos with a lot of money, connections and muscle. Um, as we know, the Jakarta governorship was a demonstration model for the kind of leadership he was to offer the whole nation. The so-called blusukan or walkabouts in local neighborhoods and markets, the quick decision to start up the 
uh, metro rail system that had been kicked around for 30 years or so and at least the beginnings of a more concerted approach to the floods that paralyse the city every rainy season. Um, now this <coughs> could not have been produced more of a contrast uh, than we've seen in the presidential election last year. This was a candidate out of the ranks of the Orang Kechil, the, the little people, whom Jokowi called the public, uh, the public, suggesting they were citizenry with rights rather than the rakyat, the, the people, the masses, uh, which uh, is com more commonly used by politicians and suggests a rather more passive audience. Um, his campaign slogan was, Jokowi is us. Um, and he was standing against the scion of uh, a very establishment um, uh, family, Prabowo Subianto, whose son, uh, son and grandson of eminent independence era uh, figures, uh, claiming uh, descent from uh, the 19th century uh, anti-Dutch rebel Prince di Ponogoro. Uh, he was one-time husband of a Sahato daughter, the special forces uh, officer who captured and killed the Fretilin leader, Nicolao Lobato, uh, rising to be a very feared army general uh, out of the even more feared Capasas special forces. And he opened his campaign by prancing into Jakarta's main football stadium on a rampant horse, uh, taking the salute from strapping young militiamen uh, wearing the national colours. Now, Jokowi won, of course, despite a huge weight of money uh, wielded by Prabowo and his uh, wealthy brother, some very dirty misinformation, including fake newspapers circulated around uh, Islamic schools suggesting that Jokowi was A, a secret Christian, and B, of Chinese descent, uh, probably some interference at polling booths and then a slew of post-election legal appeals. Uh, but he won and now we have a very new um, phenomenon, uh, an Indonesian president who's not from an elite background. Um, you can argue that Suharto was also a man of the people, but by the time he seized power in 1965-66, he was already an army general He'd been to a lot of schools, he'd mixed in elite circles, uh, and uh, it was an entirely different kind of authority that he wielded. Now, <laughs> Jokowi's only been in office since early November, so it's just over three months, and we should remember, so we should remember this is very much a presidency on, uh, still on its training wheels. Uh, it also started with a very poor hand of cards in the Jakarta political casino. The so-called Great Indonesia Coalition supporting him, uh, which is centred around the Indonesian De Democratic Party of Struggle, or PDIP, has only about 37% of the seats in Parliament. Uh, the rest, um, at least in theory, uh, belonging to Prabowo Subianto's Red and White Coalition. And it has to be remembered that the rejigging of the Indonesian political system after the fall of Suharto in 1998 took a lot of power away from the presidency and transferred it to the parliament, the DPR. Notably, the president has no American-style veto over legislation. And thirdly, the presidential election had a third figure hanging in the background, Megawati Sukarnaputri. She's, as we all know, the daughter of the first Indonesian president, Sukarno, founded the PDIP in the late, later years of the Suharto New Order and was president between the impeachment of President Gustur Abdurrahman Wahid in 2001 and her inconsolable election loss to Cecilia Bambang Yudhoyono uh, in 2004. She reluctantly handed the PDIP candidacy over to Jokowi early last year when it became apparent he was the only candidate who could beat Prabowo and any others still in the race, such as the business tycoon uh, Abu Riz al-Bakri. Uh, but she re remains in the PDIP chair 
from where she's been a backseat driver for the Jokowi administration, or for Jokowi through the election and into the presidency. And her influence was shown in the lineup of Jokowi's cabinet. There were some very good choices, such as uh, the university rector, Anis Bas Baswedan, who became the minister for school level education, and a former railway chief, Ignatius Jonan, uh, who was made transport minister, and a, and a, pretty, and a moderate Muslim, Lukman Hakim Saifuddin, as religious affairs minister, very important in the fraught sec, uh, sectarian environment of Indonesia in recent years. There were some very dubious ones, uh, bringing in friends of Megawati. One was the former army general, uh, Ria Mizad Ria Chutu, as defence minister. In 2001, some might recall that he was army chief and he praised as patriots the Kapasas soldiers who murdered the Papuan leader, uh, Te Selawe. Uh, Rini Sumarno, uh, who's a Jakarta corporate wheeler dealer with some questions about dodgy deals, um, who was made Minister for Public Enterprises. And then there was Megawati's own daughter, Puan Maharani, uh, who became coordinating minister over all the education and welfare portfolios, uh, an area where she has no known expertise. Uh, despite this, uh, uh, Jokowi got off to a very good start in his first month when he as uh, Natalie mentioned, he grasped the nettle of cutting subsidies for domestic fuel, a decision that can save the government about uh, $10 billion uh, that can be now diverted to infrastructure and human development. And the fall in oil prices has allowed the complete elimination of um, fuel subsi subsidies since. So that um, could free up potentially double that figure, $20 billion, a very big saving. Uh, from something that was essentially middle-class welfare before. Um, Jokowi and his ministers did pretty well in handling the tragedy of the Air Asia crash near Surabaya in December um, in a very um, competent and caring way. Um, but uh, the new year has brought um, a bit, uh, quite a cloud over the administration. <coughs> Um, almost certainly at Megawati's prompting, he put forward the name of one of her personal friends and political favourites, a police general named Budi Gunawan, as the sole candidate for parliamentary endorsement as the new chief of national police, a, a post that was not actually vacant at the time. Um, <laughs> this <laughs> immediately turned into a crisis when the immensely respected Corruption Eradication Commission, the KPK, named uh, Budi as General Budi as a graft suspect because of several million dollars of unaccounted for wealth in his uh, list of assets. Um, the uh, members of the police, supported by a noisy clerk of PDIP politicians, including ministers in Jokowi's cabinet, then turned on the KPK and targeted its four commissioners. The chairman, uh, Abraham Samad, was accused of breaching his oath of political impartiality because it came out that last year someone had come and talked to him about running as Jokowi's vice presidential um, running mate um, in the election. Uh, it was not clear at whose instigation this was, but um, this was made into a, a, a hanging offence by his critics. The police then also um, resurrected a number of very old and hoary cases against the other three uh, active uh, commissioners of the KPK. Um, uh, one on perjury charges brought by a PDIP politician in a case that had already been dismissed in court, um, which forced him to stand aside from the commission for uh, at least for a while. Then. Um, uh, the police took up another complaint um, against a second commissioner over alleged mishandling of company shares in 2006 and uh, another third uh, deputy commissioner um, was accused of bribery in a 2008 case 
by uh, a person who was actually um, a convicted embezzler in the same case. Uh, very tainted um, and suspect prosecutions or, or investigations. Um, but this barrage of um, uh, cases of alleged impropriety and criminal activity um, uh, actually threatened to decapitate the Anti-Corruption Commission. Um, now, overwhelmingly, the Indonesian media has seen no merit in any of these cases and sees only revenge by the police at having one of their insiders fingered for alleged corruption. Uh, and the sense of Jokowi as a political captive increased this month when he visited uh, neighbouring Malaysia. And uh, there was the astonishing turn when Jokowi toured the factory of the Malaysian car manufacturer Proton, which you'll all remember was the white elephant um, project of Mahathir Mohamad as Prime Minister, producing what were essentially um, rebadged Mitsubishis as a Malaysian national car and then trying to export them around the world. Um, Mahathir, of course, is long retired but still <coughs> sticking his oar into everything in Malaysia and he remains the chairman of Proton. Um, Jokowi uh, at the factory witnessed the signature of an agreement for Proton to um, to, to begin a joint venture partnership uh, in Indonesia wor working towards production of an so-called Indonesian car, uh, which might, of course, Mahathir suggested start by importing fully made up cars from Malaysia. Um, now this, of course, will bring to my many minds the national car of Tommy Sahato in the 1990s, which turned out to be just a South Korean car fully imported. Uh, the Indonesian partner in the Proton deal is a company called Adi Perkasa Chitra Lestari, uh, which uh, the Indo Indonesian Ministry of Industry um, uh, struggled to find any reference for uh, or any um, record of a existing business. Its unique selling point, however, <coughs> seems to be that its chairman is one A.M. Hendro Priono, who was there at the signing. Now, Hendro, as he's nicknamed, is, <coughs> was the government minister for uh, transmigration in 1999, who helped organize the forcible deportation of tens of thousands of East Timorese after the uh, UN referendum to, as a kind of staged artificial protest against the, the actual result, uh, which was overwhelmingly for independence. To, to somehow try and discredit the UN vote. In 2004, uh, Hendro was Megawati's chief of the National Intelligence Agency, BIN, B -I -N, when its operatives carried out the assassination of the human rights activist Munir Ta uh, Said Talib uh, by slipping him uh, um, arsenic in an orange juice aboard a, on a flight, um, on a Garuda flight. Um, Last year, Hendro surfaced as campaign advisor to Megawati and a member of the panel helping form Jokowi's cabinet. Now, um, <clears throat> the crisis over the new police chief has dragged on now for more than a month. The candidate, Budi, General Budi Gunawan, went to court and found a judge who yesterday ruled that the KPK <coughs> had indeed uh, acted improperly in naming him as a suspect and consequently um, PDIP and other politicians in the Commission 3, the commission that essentially uh, wields the power of approval of appointments, is now jumping up and down asking for him his appointment to go ahead. Um, <coughs> Jokowi has put off a decision again, but it's not making him look any, any more decisive by doing that. And it's against this background that he and his attorney general started lining up drug convicts for the firing squad last month, uh, with Jokowi announcing uh, an Indonesian drug emergency that experts say is based on wildly exaggerating statistics that uh, essentially um, inflate all drug users as um, uh, 
as addicts. Um, <coughs> so this is not exactly the case of wretches, wretches hang that jury men might dine, as Alexander Pope once put it, but it's suspiciously like a, a gruesome and large scale, large scale law and order diversion from current political embarrassments. If Chikowi is really serious about drugs, he could drive down from the presidential palace down Jalan Haim Wuruk to clubs like the so-called illegal uh, that are regarded as centres of the amphetamine trade and are said to have senior police and army protection. It may be that Jokowi is playing a deep game of giving Megawati and the PDIP enough rope to hang themselves in the eyes of the public, if you could excuse the rather unfortunate metaphor for this period. Um, and certainly he would be very unwise to let the KPK um, be crippled or um, as this institution probably has more lasting popularity than his own. Um, he um, can perhaps look one day to shaking off Megawati. Um, the Constitutional Court ruled before the election uh, that in future presidential elections the candidates no longer have to have the backing of 20% of the parliament, uh, or parties with 20% of the parliament, to stand for president. So uh, the, um, the need for Jokowi to, to have the backing of the PDIP will lessen uh, in 2018, 2019, um, assuming his popular, personal popularity remains that high. Against that, he may have some attachment to the PDIP. His father was a great Sukarnoist who used to go off to Blitar to, to um, absorb the radiance of the great man at the tomb there. Uh, and uh, he may find it hard to move away, um, but that's a possibility. Um, the other um, encouraging sign for him that two parties in the Prabowo Red and White Coalition, Golkar and the PPP, a Muslim party, have had leadership splits with new factions forming that want to draw the party um, away into uh, support for the president. Um, and um, it's um, a truism that, you know, the DPR essentially, uh, especially Golkar, is motivated by the um, by the patronage uh, advantages of politics will tend to gravitate <coughs> towards the government where it can. Um, one, one problem is that very few outsiders have had a chance to draw Jokowi into deep conversation about his views and about his knowledge. Um, he almost floated into the lead Indonesian leadership like the Gardner chants in the movie Being There. Uh, <laughs> He does seem open to new ideas, including removing controls on access to Papua, but has not shown himself a man of wide interests and tastes. Uh, he's known to like heavy metal rock music, which is not very, uh, perhaps rather reinforces his stark views of capital punishment. Um, uh, um, but he's a man that desperately needs to be cultivated and um, uh, the lesson for our politicians is to get as close as possible to him and it's a pity that this um, uh, capital punishment issue has come up so early um, with um, so many distractions both um, here and and in Jakarta for our political leaders from from foreign foreign policies. Um, now during the election last year uh, which coincided with the Muslim fasting month, I went along to a fast-breaking dinner held by Yeni Wahid, um, who's a daughter of the late President Gostur, uh, and still leads a splinter of his old National Awakening Party, um, which drew on the membership of his religious organization, the uh, Nadatul Ulama. Now, Yeni um, is an old friend. She used to work for the City Morning Herald, and. Uh, was uh, holed up in the Herald House in Dili with me and several others and a group of 
Australian Federal Police and uh, with the militia rampaging around in um, around the streets. Um, so I know her quite well and it turns out she's the only Indonesian politician who uh, has a Walkley Award um, <laughs> as she <laughs> shared in the Walkley that our team got for foreign coverage that year, um, which uh, would be interesting if she ever does manage to climb to the top of the political heap in Jakarta. Um, but she um, threw off this notion of Jokowi as the a kind of Petruk Dari Raja, Ratu uh, character. Now, Petruk, as you'll all know, is one of the four characters inserted into the Mahabharata, um, the Wayang theatre, the puppet theatre, and, and the human theatre, the Katopra, by the Javanese. They're the kind of peasant, the wise peasants, led by the waddling Samar who prances on in a rather coarse sarong, and in contrast to the gorgeous warrior clothes of the main characters. And they present a kind of um, comic counterpoint that often produces a resolution where all the ph philosophizing of people who agonize over the Bhagavad Gita and so on have been unable to bring themselves to solution. And Samar and his three sidekicks, um, um, Bagong, Petruk and Garang, somehow blunder their way through and help produce um, produce a solution. It's when um, essentially the Dalang or the director throws a switch to vaudeville and the audience perceptively relaxes. Well, Petruk is the tall skinny one of the three sidekicks and in this particular story he picks up a talisman of power that's accidentally dropped by a warrior prince and finds himself king with very comic and chaotic results. Now, um, for Yeni to make that observation was perhaps an example of the um, sometimes cruel and very funny wit of the Jakarta um, political scene, but one that stuck with me and makes me wonder whether um, Jokowi will be overwhelmed, will, is really an innocent who will be brought down and compromised by the cynical political forces around him. Uh, it's far too early to say that, but it's a worry. And perhaps even faster than the loss of Barack Obama's aura, Jokowi is testing the wave of optimism and idealism that brought him to the presidency. Thank you very much. And, uh, and answer time now. Um, if I could ask you all to keep your questions please brief um, and just to one question per person please. Um, to kick things off I'll ask a question quickly of Hamish. Um, Hamish, I was wondering if you had the opportunity to interview President Jokowi, what would you ask him as a matter of priority and why? Um, I think I'd start by asking him about heavy metal. <laughs> I think. Get, him, get him relaxed and then uh, once he's softened up a bit head into the question of corruption, uh, the question of connection, the question of class in Indonesia, whether he sees uh, class behind the pattern of politics that, and leadership that has ruled in Indonesia um, since independence, um, where he sees the kind of um, the source of economic drive for Indonesia, whether I, I'd rather suspect he would see it a virtue in the fact that the informal sector of Indonesia isn't shrinking, uh, despite all the coal and energy boom of the last decade, um, pouring wealth into Jakarta, um, formal employment still um, hovers at less than 30%. So 71% or so of the workforce is essentially employing themselves or working for someone they know. Um, now that's um, in cl probably classic development theory, uh, uh, a, a drawback. And, uh, but in a way it uh, creates a great resilience and it creates a great dispersal of activity. And now that um, people have got mobile phones. Indonesia is one of the countries like India and China that's just exploded into 
mobile phone and connectivity, um, much more access to personal transport. Um, there's, there's a possibility of a, a more broad-based, more democratic type of economy evolving, and I'd just like to talk to him about that. Yes, um, Hamish, could I just ask about current events and the, uh, the death penalty issue? You, you said that Jacoby might have taken the hard line he has as a diversion against the uh, difficulties he's having in some other areas. Is that an issue in, within Indonesia of sufficient weight to actually do him much good? I mean, is the, would, if he holds to the hard line, Will that result in a surge in his popularity? Um, look, I, I, I don't really know enough to say that. It's, it's an exercise of state power, you know, almost the ultimate exercise of state power to take life. And um, uh, to a certain segment of Indonesia, it would appeal, being tough on, on drugs and so on. Um, I think uh, I can certainly see in the Indonesian press uh, a lot of commentary that it's counterproductive for Indonesia that has more than, I think, um, 360 Indonesians on death row in other countries, of whom, you know, about two thirds are uh, drug offenders, uh, whom the Indonesian government's trying to win clemency for, for them to be. Um, doing a blanket execution, no reviews, no extenuating circumstances, so on. So I think that message is starting to get through, uh, certainly among the thinking classes. Um, look, I, I just don't know enough. It, it could play quite well, I suppose, that um, um, middle, lower class people might, who've probably seen a lot of drug dealing around their, their places, that that they might applaud it, so uh, uh, it, it may work, um, and it's coincidental. I mean, the same Attorney General who's involved in the appointment of the policeman, although he's not a Megawati Party person, would, would be the one driving the uh, pace of the executions too. Um, what role, if any, does tribalism religion and geography play in Indonesian politics? Oh, well, um, <laughs> an awful lot. Um, and the, all that used to be the kind of taboo subjects for the Indonesian media, you know, suku, agama, and whatever else, the, 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 the no subjects for the Indonesian press to play upon. But they do, obviously. And, the the um, the electoral calculus is, takes into that, and in, in, certainly in terms of choice of the running mate. You know, his running mate is um, a very Muslim figure from the uh, Salibis Islands, Sulawesi. Um, so uh, he's very carefully positioned with a Javanese, soft Muslim, um, Abangan type of figure. Um, it, um, it, it, it's, it's very important. The uh, Javanese are still the biggest group, um, uh, but um, others are influential and some of the parties have different electoral bases. Golkar tends to be more popular in the outer islands and where there's much more can-do entrepreneurialism and resource extraction and deals and so on. And the uh, Nationalist Party and uh, PDIP in Java and the religious parties um, variously in, depending on their flavor of Islam and on, on either Java or parts of Java, and again, which parts in West Java, East Java, Central Java, and then others in Sumatra, Sulawesi and parts of Kalimantan, and then Christian areas in eastern Indonesia are also important. So it's it's very much part of the calculus. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. Both. Yeah. Um, the, the current crisis between the police and the Corruption Commission yeah. is going to be the key to whether Mr. Jacoby is going to succeed or fail. And I say that because it brings to light the fundamental question that they've got to address, and it's the issue of corruption. And his chief of staff recently told the CSIS in, in Washington that there was going to be no problem for Jacoby because all he had to do was threaten anybody who opposed him with the KPK or the Anti-Corruption Commission, and he'd get his way in one way or another. But of course, What's happened in this whole process is that, as you say, effectively the KPK has been de decapitated. And there's a lot of parliamentary support for that. And there's no question of, of uh, white and black. It's, it's all grey. Um, and the, the question will be whether he can resuscitate the KPK as it was, or whether he has to do some sort of political deal with the parliament and and introduce a new anti-corruption policy that takes a far broader approach than just the criminalisation of corruption. And I'm just wondering whether you could uh, say something about where you think this, the Parliament would stand on that and how, what sort of compromises they could make with the President to yeah. come up with some sort of solution. Well, the Parliament, which opinion polls have shown is ranked as the most corrupt in institution in, in Indonesia by Indonesians, um, <laughs> would dearly like to have the KPK off its back and, and allow business as usual. Um, now, SBY, although, you know, became known as a great fence-sitter and do-nothing president in the end, did to his great credit not try to nobble the KPK, even when it made huge inroads into his own party. Um, and that legacy passed on to Jokowi. Now, Jokowi did use KPK vetting to knock out some of the wor even worse candidates who are put up for cabinet positions. And now he's got, as you say, the, the really big test because it's pitting um, the, um, the institution against the, f the favourite rumoured ex-boyfriend of Megawati, Budi Gunawan, um, for the top job in the police. And the police, although there are some very fine figures in the police, is, is another um, huge um, corruption machine. Um, so uh, this this is probably a critical test. If if the KPK is decapitated um, and stripped of its powers, then Indonesia will quickly slide back into the worst of the old era, uh, and Jokowi's presidency will be greatly tainted. Uh, I doubt you know that he would um, be able to stand up to much in, in 2019 if, if, if this goes ahead. It's a critical early test. And maybe it's uh, one in which Megawati has overreached herself. Possibly. Um, we, we, we wait and see. But it's, the longer it drags on, it's not, not helping Jokowi. No. Jack, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Oh. Uh, I think the previous speaker here mentioned that the uh, the vice presidency of Yusuf Kala was a little bit of a forced marriage. I'm not sure whether that's true or not. But, uh, a little bit, of, sorry. Of a f it was a bit of a force that Jokowi does, didn't necessarily feel terribly comfortable with Kala. I don't know whether it's true or not. But what is the role, what role is Kala uh, have in the administration or what sort of emerging role does he have? Just for the people at the other side, it was a question about the role of the vice president for Yusuf Kala. Yeah. Well, I think the great task of Yusuf Kala is to prize Golkar out of the hands of Abu Rizal Bakri and get that little evil uh, character out of poli serious politics uh, and off off the uh, tap of public money and and state bank loans um, that has sustained his crooked companies for so long. Um, if he can break Golkar, encourage the split in Golkar and bring Golkar over to the government side, he would have um, earned his dues as vice president. Now, he's also another very commendable character. I mean, he forced through the Arche peace process when uh, SBY probably wavered, and he made a number of snap decisions on his own that he 
um, presented as fait accompli to to um, to SBY. So he's got a lot of stripes in that area too, and could potentially do a lot with some bold decisions on Papua, perhaps, and some of the other and you know, religious disputes. Um, so he's he's a valuable asset. All right, we'll go to Miles and then gentlemen. My name is Miles Cooper. Yeah. Um, so Koei's obviously got a whole bunch of domestic challenges um, and uh, some on the international scene, but do you have any sense yet of how he's going to play Indonesia's role within ASEAN? He's begun the <coughs> obligatory circuit of visits around ASEAN, but do you think that he and his foreign minister and administration have the wherewithal or the interest to assert a, a leading role for Indonesia? Um, they're both pretty inexperienced in, in regional affairs. His foreign minister is more, um, more experienced in Europe and relations with Europe than, than in the region. And she's quite young and um, doesn't have political clout. There's been a tradition of promoting foreign ministers out of the diplomatic ranks. So they often they tend to <coughs> act, act, still act like officials rather than political figures. Um, I think he, in the election, he um, he raised some queries by suggesting that the ASEAN um, economic um, area that's supposed to be up and running by the end of this year uh, could be something that the Indonesian bureaucracy uh, be allowed to thwart by um, throwing up obstacles to foreign companies uh, in their competition with Indonesian players. And you're very easy to hear um, examples of that happening already. I interviewed the uh, head of Bangkok, Siam Cement, who took on the two or three big Indonesian uh, cement companies who have a very uh, uh, ol oligopolistic control of pricing and make construction more expensive than it should be. And, um, the relevant ministries favour the uh, the local companies, whether it's in industry or telecoms or transport or whatever. Um, so he's got that issue with that. That is the key issue with ASEAN this year, I think. Um, I suspect they will play the sort of moderate but a slightly tougher role towards the South China Sea dispute. And then that's continuity. They've been beefing up the um, placement of um, Navy and Air Force assets in the Natuna Islands and in the Indonesian islands of the South China Sea. Uh, and the military is, um, is getting developing more as a conventional um, um, force, uh, particularly Army, Navy, and his maritime development strategy will only encourage that. So uh, it, I don't know that Jokowi is driving that, but Indonesia is heading in that direction to a, be a much harder regional power. I think the main worry is whether it will be dragging, dragging its feet on the ASEAN free trade zone. Right, we have a question for the gentleman, I think, and then um, how likely do you think it would be for Jokowi to gain greater power within the party of struggle? Um, I think it would be very hard. Um, as I mentioned, Megawati's got him to promote her daughter, Puan Maharani, as this coordinating minister. And next year there will be a party convention where it's expected she'll put the daughter forward as her replacement as party party leader, so she probably hopes that um, the daughter will uh, develop as a presidential candidate. Um, so uh, I think Jokowi would be pushing uphill to take over the party and make it his own, but it's possible that Puan Maharani might be knocked out by if she demonstrates great incompetence or insensitivity and just doesn't develop any um, clear following. It, it is possible, um, but he could also start his own party as SPY did um, and uh, develop that as a base to, to organise coalitions around. Right, Ian, and then we'll go to this side. 
Ian Dodgen, uh, Hamish. Ian, hi. You mentioned briefly uh, West Papua yeah. earlier in the piece. Can you elaborate on that and what line he's likely to take and what the pressures will be for and against? Oh, well, um, during the campaign he um, was asked whether he agreed with the current um, uh, controls on visits by foreign journalists and NGOs and, you know, uh, UN people are all very carefully vetted by a so-called steering committee that uh, of the various security agencies and foreign affairs and uh, internal affairs and so on. Um, he said, why not? Why, what have we got to hide? Let's do it. Well, he hasn't actually done that yet. Um, but um, he did um, visit uh, Papua over the New Year when there was a clash involving uh, army and police in the Panayai Lake area a few weeks back. He um, made a point of uh, launching an investigation into that. He's talked of uh, opening a presidential residence in near Jayapura uh, for the president to go and actually stay in Papua for a while. Um, I don't think he would entertain any idea of letting Papua go or have its own um, referendum, I think. Uh, but he might hope that by taking the lid off and allowing its rather desperate political class to do their greedy worst, that the um, political pressure for independence might be dissipated a bit. Um, his wife, actually, incidentally, is called Iriana, and I presume that she was named uh, thus in the early 60s as after the uh, Sukarno's campaign to take the territory from the Dutch, and uh, I imagine that he's as attached to the narrative of Sabang to Merauke as, as most Indonesians are. So. Um, it's possible he might loosen the, loosen the uh, lid on Papua. Uh, one hopes he does, but we're waiting to see that. All right, we'll go to this side. Yeah, Jack. Yeah. Jack, I have two questions uh, for you. Firstly, is this last uh, week's Prabowo, uh, uh, <coughs> President Jokowi invited Prabowo openly to the Istana, and then because uh, they are rival in that election. Uh, we had a meeting, an hour meeting, and then I followed the news. This last few days, we do not any knowledge. Bravo has already entered the Istana from the back door. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, now it's the news that Djokovic is going to move to Bogor. It's close to Bravo. Bravo lives not far from Bogor. So, do you think any connect connection now? And that, that suggestion that Gurindra invited him to join Gurindra. So do you think Prabowo's, I mean, uh, Jokowi is getting away from Megawati? That's the first question. Second question oh. is, <laughs> second question is about this general. Uh, the latest news is he is already cleared from corruption, the uh, Pradilan. Jokowi has uh, congratulated him. Uh, as you know, it's big news about General Budi Gunawan. So do you think is if Jokowi really takes seriously about this Gunawan and become the head of the police force, is the end of Jokowi? Uh, Hamish, before you do, I'll just repeat the question to this side of the room if you didn't hear. The first question was about the relationship between Jokowi and Prabowo Subianto. And the second question is, if Jokowi successfully appoints Gunawan as Paul Re uh, head of the police, will that be the end of Jokowi? Sorry, Hamish. Um, well, the second question is, I indicated before, I think it, if, if it's a victory for a tainted police general um, over, well, over the KPK, then it would definitely be a big, uh, do an awful lot of damage to Jokowi. It wouldn't be the end, I mean, it's, but it would cripple, you know, damage his standing a lot over the <coughs> remainder of this term. Um, on Prabowo, I've noted that he's played a rather more friendly line towards Jokowi during this crisis and is not jumping up and down and making as much capital as he might have. Um, 
Now he did, in 2012, um, essentially pluck um, Jokowi out of Solo and bring him to Jakarta to stand in coalition with Garindra um, for the Jakarta governorship. And it was almost like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, you know, that eventually uh, became so successful that he turned on his own master and um, denied Prabowo the chance to be president last year. Um, I guess Prabowo is still hanging in, hoping that somehow he can turn events to his way and if he could convince um, Jokowi that he'll make his five-year term a, a booming success, uh, give him political support and that maybe Jokowi might agree to stand down after one term and hand the baton over to Prabowo with his full support that maybe that's his game, I don't know. He's, he's ambitious and perhaps deluded enough to think that he could do that. Um, hope dies hard in the hearts of politicians, so maybe that's the game. But he, uh, I don't think the move to Bogor as, as a presidential residence is linked to that. I, I shouldn't think so. Thank you. And one final question for the evening. Um, my name is Richard Wilson. If the executions go ahead, which now seems inevitable, what do you think the effect will be on the longer term relationship between the two countries as a result of this? And, and again, just for those at the back, the question asked was about the impact of the executions on the long term trend of the relationship. Um, well, I, I think it will be. Uh, It, it will cool things a lot for a while and some people will be very disappointed and wonder, you know, there'll be people saying, oh, let's stay away and what's the point of trying to make friends with them? We don't share the same values and so on. I'm sure um, for some, a lot of Australians it won't matter. The opinion polls show uh, a fairly high level of support for the death penalty and um, um, it's interesting that, and perhaps just entirely coincidental, that the two Australian citizens remaining on death row from the Bali Nine are both of Asian extraction. I just wonder if they're testing us to see how much we protest on behalf of people who aren't, you know, white people like the most of us. And um, I think, fortunately, that's not being the case. Um, and it wasn't the case with Van Nguyen either in Singapore. Um, it's going to be horrendous as they get on to a, the list of all the other dozens of people on death row and who include people from all countries and all ages and, and sex and so on. It's going to be pretty gruesome if they carry on. Um, I don't know. I think it will cool things. It, won't be welcome, but I don't think we have any choice but to get closer and get involved. I think the best thing we could do is to say, right, let's have a real war on drugs and um, see if you like it. <laughs>